Matthew chapter 6, verses 19-24 to 24. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Well, Jesus is going to talk to us today about our treasure. And we treasure a lot of things. Our treasure is something that we value, we put a priority on, we spend a lot of time, effort, money. Uh, treasure is something we'll protect like we have to have it, we'll make sure that it stays safe. Sometimes we treasure uh, position, we treasure power, we treasure influence. Many times our treasures have kind of a monetary value. And we start to treasure things as young, right? How many, when you were kids, you had a stuffy, you had an animal, you had a toy, you had a doll, you carried with, with you everywhere. Some of you, you've gone to great lengths to recover a lost stuffy somewhere or driven back miles to recover it. I had some of those things growing up, but then our treasures, they kind of become a, a little more mature, let's say. And so this is uh, just a symbol of one thing that's my treasure. I have a whole set of these red glass dishes. They kind of like match the carpet that we have here uh, at Bayview. I got plates, cups, uh, glasses, and these were my grandparents. They're not very expensive. They're not antique. Uh, they're like every day, but they were kind of cool growing up. And every birthday dinner, like I always wanted them on these red dishes. So I got to keep them. Now I make my kids have birthday dinners on red dishes. Like they have to do that. I have carried this glassware across country lines. I paid a lot to have it moved and shipped because it's valuable to me. It's a treasure. What do you treasure? A lot of us sometimes treasure convenience, right? We treasure a lot. So we'll spend $6 for a cup of coffee instead of making our own. We just treasure and value convenience or we want a really good cup of coffee. Some of us, we treasure travel, right? Going to exotic places, going to different places. Maybe it's having restaurants, experiences. We value travel. We're going to spend a lot of time thinking about where we're going to travel next, planning for that. Some of us, it's health, right? So we spend a lot of money on fitness and on diet. And so we track, right, our steps. We track our sleep. We track our heart rate. We track our health to make sure that we're healthy and we invest in that. Others of us, like, we value fashion, right? We'll spend a lot of money at Lululemon for clothes we sweat in. <laughs> I'm not sure I really understand why we want a lot of money of something that's going to get sweaty. You're going to tell me, oh, it's the best. And like, helps you. I'm probably not going to work out anyway, so I'm not going to invest uh, in that. Some of us, it's like a game, a challenge, right? It's electronics. It's a gadget. What's the newest, the best, the latest that we have to have? That's our treasure. We, maybe we treasure um, experiences. Like um, Here's like what's probably the most valuable treasure in Toronto right now, two Taylor Swift tickets. $7,000 on Ticketmaster. Anybody want them? Maybe we should raffle them off at the end of the third service uh, when we start. That might get people to come um, in case you think they're, they're fake. So they're not real. But everybody's Taylor Swift, we gotta go. She's coming to Toronto. It's everything. What do you treasure? What's valuable? 
And Jesus here is going to challenge us on deciding what to do with our treasures. And he's going to say, really, the best way to treasure life now is to store up treasure for eternity. The way to treasure life today is to store up treasure in eternity. If you want to live well, it's not investing in these treasures. It's storing up treasure in eternity. So I invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 6, and we're continuing in the Sermon on the Mount, this 22-minute sermon where Jesus here invites us to experience the fullness of the kingdom. He's invited us to understand what we've been called to as he calls us to a new life, an upside-down, inside-out life with him. The last few weeks, we looked at really the heart of the kingdom and some practices of the kingdom. Today, he wants to really look at this issue of treasure because there's nothing that grabs or captivates our heart like what we treasure and value. This is what grabs our heart. And so Jesus says, there's two ways you can have treasure. There's two treasures. Treasures on earth or treasure in heaven. He says in verse 19, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, or where thieves break in and steal. But instead, store up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy, and where thieves don't break in and steal. And so he's going to challenge us. Where are we treasuring? Where are we putting our time, our talent, our treasure, our investment? Is it something here or in eternity, and he's gonna say, this is a big deal. You may say, well, what's the big deal? What does it matter? Jesus says, this is a big deal because it's gonna shape some things in our life. That our treasure forms our identity, our treasure forecasts our future, and our treasure determines who our boss is, what owns us. And so we want to look first at just what are the implications of our treasure? What we focus on has implications in our life. So look at that, and then we'll talk about where to best invest. So the first thing Jesus says, he says, be careful about how you choose your treasure because our treasures form our identity. Who we are, everything about us, it's formed by our treasure that often we become known Really, by what we treasure. Some of us, we're known, what? As, as fashionistas. We're known for our fashion. We're known for what we look, like how we look. We want to look good. We're known for the clothes that we have. We spend a lot of investment because it makes us feel good. If we dress well, it somehow makes us feel better about ourselves. It identifies us. I had an aunt and uncle who traveled like crazily, back in the 1960s when I was a kid. My cousin, my cousin went to summer camp in Bermuda. Who goes to summer camp in Bermuda today, let alone, you know, 50 years ago? But they were the traveling, like they were known for that. They had to do that. Some of us were known, right, for the gadgets we have. I had another uncle, like he was Mr. Gadget. Something new came out, something electronic, some new thing came out. He had to, he had to have it. And you knew, like I always know, I didn't have to go buy it because my uncle would have it. I could go see it, test it out because he would always have it. Some of us, right, we're known for the experience. Like we're going to go. There's a concert in town. We're going to go. There's a new restaurant. We're going to go. We're known as the experienced people. We are often known and identified by our treasure. And friends, this is frightening because this is why we live in fear and anger. Because we live in fear, we're going to lose our treasure. Right? You go to Taylor Swift, what's next? How are you going to up that? There's what we call the law of diminishing returns. You have one amazing experience. You got to have another one. If that's what defines you, you've got to find another concert. Who's another venue? Who's coming in town next? If you had a good meal at a restaurant, what's the next one? What's the next hit of pleasure going to be? If you're known for your travel, then you've got to find another exotic destination to go to. Our treasure, it forms and identifies us. And we're always trying to get more and more and more. And often our self-worth as a person is defined by our treasure. Our self-worth is often determined by our net worth, what we have. 
and what we treasure. And so we always want more of it. I only feel better if I get the next new line of clothes, if I'm looking better. I'm only going to feel good about myself if I update my car and have the next newest model. I'm only going to feel good about myself if I get the next thing. We are defined by our treasures because this is what Jesus says in Matthew 6, 21. Where your treasure is, your heart's going to be also. Where your treasure is, that's your heart. Now, sometimes we think our hearts, kind of like our emotions or our feelings, this is where our, our feelings going, what we feel good about. The heart in the ancient world was not the seat of feelings. Your bowels, your gut, your stomach was the seat of feelings. Your heart is the seat of your will, your determination, with choices you make. And Jesus here says, where your heart is, there your treasure is. What you identify with, what forms your identity is your treasure. And friend, this is such good news. What Jesus gives us is really good news. It feels so countercultural because he wants to be the treasure. You don't have to be identified by this stuff. You don't have to be limited by your treasure. Jesus tells a story of a man who sold everything to buy a field where there was a pearl that was priceless, that Jesus is our treasure, that we get to know him and our identity is in him. We struggle so much trying to find our identity in this stuff. Our identity is in Christ. We are a new creation. We are a son or daughter of the king. We are a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. We are a brand new creation, a masterpiece. That we are who Jesus says we are. We're not defined by this. Jesus came to give us something more and richer. That we're defined by him. Look at the scripture, what he says about us. This is my beloved. I'm well pleased. We're defined as a friend of Jesus. That's who we are. And so Jesus says, watch out how you choose your treasure because your treasure determines your identity. Secondly, he says, our treasures, they forecast our future. You look at your treasure, it will tell you where you're going. You look at where you want to go, your treasure, it will follow. And basically what Jesus said, what we behold, what we look at, what we focus on is what we eventually become. It's what our future is. And so Jesus uses this kind of ancient, perhaps saying or idea about the eye. He talks about two treasures. Now he talks about two eyes. And in verse 22, he says, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if the eye is healthy, your whole body, it will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your body will be full of darkness. If the light is in you, uh, or if then the light in you is darkness, though, how great is the darkness? And Jesus here says the eye is the lamp of the body. It's like the window that what's outside comes in, what's in comes out. And we know that what we see, right? You want light to be able to see. And if your eye is good, if it's healthy, you can see out. You're not going to stumble it uh, around. And if it's dark, right? If you're like my age and you have to go to the bathroom several times in the night and you try to get up and not turn the light on because you want to keep it dark and you can't see, right? You're going to stumble around. It's not good. You want light. You want a healthy eye because a healthy eye lets in more light. But the eye also reveals what's inside to those who are outside. It's a window, right? And you can sometimes tell what's really going on with the person by looking at their eyes. If a person smiles with their mouth but isn't smiling with their eyes, you kind of wonder, are they faking it? If you're in sales, you're probably trained to look at people's eyes. If you're a car salesman, right, and someone comes in to the showroom, what do you do? You watch where they look. 
What are they fixated on? What are they beholding? Because what they look at, how they look, it tells you a lot about what's inside. And so Jesus here is saying that our eyes, right, are a window in what's important. And often what do our eyes do? Our eyes focus on our treasure and what we value. And so Jesus says you can have a healthy eye or an unhealthy eye. Now, he's not really talking here about how, you know, 2020 vision or whatever your eye can see. He's really talking about the eye of your soul. And the, the ancients, they had this idea, which you probably heard, about like the evil eye. And a healthy eye would look out at life, look for grace and kindness, wonder, look, look for love, look, look for the light of what's happening, the good things. An unhealthy or an evil eye would look what stingily on the world, would want things, would say, I don't want someone else to have my treasure. I get envious and jealous when someone else travels like I don't. It's like, how come they got some new fashion and I didn't get it? I don't want them to have it because I don't want them to want up me. An unhealthy eye is so fixated on this that it's not generous with the world. And Jesus is going to say, if this is all you look at, if this is what you see, if this is all you're fixated from, if you're trying to cram as many of these treasures in a box and hold on to the weight, this is darkness. Because this isn't going to take you somewhere because this is a dead end. These treasures are dead end investments. And Jesus here, what we look at, like we move towards what we look at. And what we see is where we're going. It's our future. If this is all we look at, this stuff is our future. Now, when I was a kid, on the farm, I would drive tractor, and sometimes we have these large fields. And when you're cultivating a field or plowing a field or cutting down hay, you often like would have to strike the field. You have to kind of go to the middle of the field, and you'd like go in a straight line from one side of the field to the other. And if you were just looking down and you're looking over and you're looking behind, you're going to zigzag through that field. You're never going to get there. The way to cut a straight line was to keep focused on a far point, one point that's at the, the opposite side of the field, and you just you never waver. You keep looking at that. If you want to get there, you keep looking at that. And that's what Jesus says. What eye do you have? Do you have an eye that's just on this and gathering more and wanting more and hoarding treasure and getting a box? Or do you have an eye for eternity? And in many ways, what, what Jesus is reminding us is that we often, this treasure, like we often see life like this. And that really our life, like we look at this little silver end. This is our 60, 70, 80, 90 years that we have on earth. And this is our investment in this life. And we put every bit of energy, effort, investment on living this well. And Jesus says, that's a dead end. That's not wise. Because we're eternal beings. This is 60, 70, 80 years. Then this is 60 or 70, 80 years. This is a few more years. This is 100 years. This is a century. This is like a millennium. And you still got eternity left. And if all your eye is, is how can I get as much as I can out of this life, that's dark. How great is that darkness? He says, instead, we should be thinking, thinking about eternity. What are you doing to invest? Are you looking only at just these next few years or are you looking at eternity? and what could be. And if you're looking for eternity, you're gonna make different and wiser investments. If you, only, if you only look here, if you're investing here, you're investing in hell, Jesus would say, because you're not investing longer. You're not making an investment in heaven. So our treasure 
right? If this is what we look at, if this is what we're longing for, right? This is dark. This is our future. Thirdly, Jesus says that our treasure becomes our mass boss, that our treasure becomes our bosses. And in 624, Jesus says, no one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And so there's two treasures, two eyes, and Jesus says you can have two bosses. That you can have this as a boss or eternal treasure as a boss. And what Jesus is saying is the more we vest in this, this will own us, right? This will boss us around. All of a sudden, everything comes in. You have fashion, you put money in clothes, you put money in stuff, then that will control you. You will have to clean it. You will have to wash it. You will have to take good care of it. You will have to replace it. You have to be thinking, when is it outdated? What is it going to do? You have to put a lot of time and effort and investment in that. If, if travel is your boss, you're always looking for the next deal. Where's the next place? It's going to control your time, your talent, your treasure. It will become your boss. It's all you begin to think about. I can't lose this. I cannot not be the travel guy. I have to put some more investment. It will control you. Have you ever looked, most of us throw them out, the, the instruction booklet or the guidebook for all the things you buy? Do you ever read the whole thing cover to cover? No one does that. If you look at almost all those instruction books buried at the back, there's always some paragraphs in fine print that talk about the maintenance of everything you buy. How often you need to maintain it, what you have to do, how often you have to clean it, how often you have to oil it. I remember buying a swing set for my kids when they were young and put it together and put it up and thought, oh good, that's it. Then I flipped over the last page, you know, because you follow the instructions, I flipped over the last page and I was like, Every week I'm to tighten the bullets or the, the bolts. Every week I have to oil it. Every week I have to do things. I have to keep it safe. Like that swing set was going to control my time. Because I was going to have to spend an inordinate amount of time just on a swing set. Read the instruction, how you're supposed to maintain your washer or your dryer or clean your dishwasher or clean your stove or check the fridge or replace the filter in your fridge. Once we have these treasures, they own us. They own us. And Jesus says, why are you investing in all this? They own us. God bless those of you who have like a cottage or a lake house and you have to do double the maintenance, like I'm always thinking, why do you do that? <laughs> Thank you for inviting me. I don't have to do the maintenance. I always tell them, like, find someone who has something and then enjoy it. <laughs> right? The more we have our treasure, it owns us. And a lot of us, right, a lot of us feel bad. We don't have what other people have. Like, you're maybe saying, well, look, Terry, like, I don't got nothing. Like, I wish I could afford somebody. I don't got nothing. Friends, if we make more than $2 a day, we're the richest 20% of our planet. I think most of us make more than $2 a day. We're the richest 20% of the whole planet. We have stuff. And we spend a lot of time, Jesus next week is going to talk about worry. We spend a lot of time worrying that we don't have this stuff. And Jesus says, why are you worried? Because it forms you in a person you don't want to be. It forecasts a very short-minded future. You're not prepared for the long game. And this will control you. It controls you. And you may say, no, no, like Terry, I can love money and stuff and love Jesus. 
right? Jesus here says, you can't love God and money. You can't do it. And most of us would say, you know what? I can have two part-time jobs. I can love Jesus and I can love my stuff. I can do that. I can do both of those. And, And Jesus says, you can't do it. Because if you love your stuff, you will eventually come to hate and be upset with God because he's going to challenge you about your stuff. You will come to despise him. If you love God, you will come to see what this treasure really is. You will come to see it's not the be all and the end all. So Jesus says you can't love both. You have to choose. And so he says, choose your treasure then wisely. Choose your treasure wisely. He says in verse 19, don't lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves don't break in and steal for where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be. So Jesus says, know what your treasure will do. It forms your identity, forecasts your future. It becomes your boss. You understand that, so choose. Choose earthly treasure or heavenly treasure. Choose to invest in this or heaven. And he says, this is not a good investment because things don't last. It's not a good investment because it'll get destroyed. It breaks down. Someone will steal it. It won't last. You know what? I was proud. Early on, I was one of the first people, you know, I was one of the first people to have a Blockbuster video card. (laughs) Where's that today? Doesn't get you anything. 20, 25 years ago, I went when my kids were very young, went, spent a lot of money to get a really good camera, a digital camera, so I could take pictures of them. And so I spent a lot of money. You see someone taking pictures with this today? What do you think? (laughs) Can't they get a phone? What's wrong with that? I went to the store and I was buying it. And this friend, like you'll be impressed, this camera, five megapixels. (laughs) And I said to the guy, I said, It's fine. Like, I think the eight megapixel was coming out. Like, should I invest in it? Should I pay a little more and get it? He said to me, you'll laugh. He said, you'll never need more than five megapixels in your life. You'll never need that. (laughs) Right? Jesus said, their treasures don't last. We spend a lot of money on things that we really value. They don't laugh. Money on fashion your Lululemon, your workout wear. Are you going to be buried in that? Is that what you want people seeing at the end of your day? Probably not. Your Taylor Swift experience. Right, good. It'll be a good concert. But you know, there's another young woman desperately trying to be a Taylor Swift and being the next Taylor Swift. And you know, in a few years, there's gonna be someone else that you're gonna pay $7,000 for, a couple tickets. And you go to the concert, and you have a great time, and you take your pictures, and then what? It's gone. Your travel. You got all those wonderful places, great memory. And I'm not against any of these things. I'm just saying, is it your treasure? But you're going to go, you're going to take pictures, you're going to make a PowerPoint of your pictures, you're going to actually print some of them off, old school, put them in a scrapbook, and then you will die. (laughs) And what are your kids going to do with that scrapbook? I know what mine are going to (laughs) do. Right, all these treasures that we have. Jesus said, you can invest in these. You can spend all your time, but it's all going to end up in the garbage. It's all going to end up in the wastebasket. My dad moved to a senior's home, 
sold the family house, so proud of all the treasures in the house, gave a few to family, sent the rest to auction. My dad loved this stuff. He sold it at auction. You know how much he made? $425 for all his treasures. Couldn't believe it. People don't want to pay more for that. No, dad, it's junk. People don't want that. And Jesus says, you can invest here or you can make an investment in heaven, in something eternal, something that will last and last longer. What's an investment in heaven? Well, it is in Jesus, our treasure, getting to know him, it's building a relationship, understanding who he is, hearing his voice, having his guidance, getting his wisdom, allowing the Holy Spirit to work and speak through us. We can find treasure in that. It's getting to know the one that we're going to spend eternity with. And I'm, I'm often amazed, I come to funerals and do funerals, and, and people uh, will say sometime, it's like, oh, I so want to go to heaven. Like, when I die, I so want to go to heaven. I'm like, really? Because during these 60, 70, 80 years, you could care less about getting to know Jesus. You don't want to know him here, but you want to spend all this time with him? Why would you want to spend all this time with someone that you didn't bother with here? Why would you do that? Why not get to know him now and know that he came? A treasure in heaven is understanding the resources even that we have now. Paul says we're seated in the heavenly places. Uh, Peter says we have everything today. You and I, we have everything today we need for life and godliness. Everything. We have treasure now. Jesus said, I give you the keys to the kingdom. Whatever you lose will be loose. Whatever you bind will be bound. I give you spiritual power now. That's a treasure in heaven. And Jesus said, do you invest some time in getting to know him and getting to know what he has and understanding the work of the Holy Spirit in our life? But Jesus also says that we get to bring people to heaven with us. And those are treasures in heaven. In fact, Jesus tells a story in Luke chapter 16, and he tells this story. It's kind of an odd parable. It's a parable, actually, a lot of pastors don't like to preach about because it seems unsavory. And it's like, I'm, I'm not really sure Jesus would say this. But in verse 1, Jesus said to the disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his possessions. And he called him and he said to him, what is this that I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management, for you can no longer be manager. And the manager freaked out. He's like, I've lost my job. So he said to himself, what am I going to do since my master has taken the management away from me? I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm too ashamed to beg. Ah, I know what I've decided to do. So that when I'm removed from management, people may receive me into their houses. So summoning his master's debtor one by one, he said to the first, how much do you owe my master? And he said, a hundred measures of oil. He said to him, take your bill, sit down quickly, write 50. And then he said to another, how much do you owe? He said, a hundred measures of wheat. He says, take your bill and write down 80. And the master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. For the sons of the world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. And I tell you then, Jesus said, make friends for yourself by means of unrighteous wealth so that when it fails, they may receive you into eternal dwellings. So Jesus tells the story of a guy who's going to lose his job. His business manager for a large company, a, a guy's estate, he's not doing a good job. He's dishonest, he's reputable. So he comes in and he's fired, but he's given like a week or so just to be able to settle all the accounts. You make sure everything, all the people you've dealt with, make sure that you have it taken care of. And so the guy's freaking out. He's like, what am I going to do? Because I've lost this. I've lost my treasure. I've lost the gravy train. So he says, I got to think future. I got to think what's next. And all of a sudden he's got this brilliant idea. So he goes to one client and he says, what do you owe my master? He says, oh, a hundred bushels of wheat or whatever. And, and the unsavory steward says, hey, you know what? You've been good. We've got to deal with. 
I'm going to going to leave. Why don't we just why don't we just make it 50? I'll cut you a deal. Make it 50. And the guy who owes 100 bushel of wheat, he's like amazed. He's like, thank you, thank you. Like this really helps me. And he says to the steward, if there's anything I can do for you, if there's anything I can do for you, you just ask. And the guy's going, yep, in about a week, I'm going to come for a place to stay. And then he sees another guy who owes uh, 100 gallons of oil. That's the bill. Where's your 100 gallons of oil? Well, I, I don't know if I really have it. Look, what do you have? Oh, I have 80. Okay, look, it, we've been good. We've had a good relationship. We want to keep this. Just pay 80. I'll give you a 20% discount, and it's all taken care of. And the guy's like, man, if there's anything I can do for you, anything I can do for you, you just say. And the guy's like, yep, I'm coming for a job next week. And he goes back to his boss. Now get this. He goes back to his boss. The boss has just been cheated out of some money. And what does the boss do? The boss says, hey, this was smart. Like, this was shrewd. You've got a great head on your shoulders. Because you choose to use what you could not keep to get that which you cannot lose. He says, you're shrewd. And in this sense, shrewdness was choosing to use what we cannot keep. He couldn't keep his job. He couldn't keep those relationships, but to gain what you cannot lose. He was going to have security in the future. Now, Jesus here makes an application. And you would expect Jesus to say, don't be like this guy. Don't cheat people out like that. Like you be honest. That's not what Jesus does. What is Jesus' application? Jesus says, now I tell you as an application, use your worldly wealth to make friends for yourself so when it's gone, you've got people who welcome you into heaven. Use your worldly wealth. Use treasure, not for you, not for your own identity, not to make you feel better, not to increase your self-worth. Don't use it for that. Use it for the kingdom purposes. Use it to point people to Jesus. Use it to care for others. Make friends. Invest in people. And Jesus said, that's where I treasure. Because then you'll have people in heaven. You're going to have people who are not just your buddies here. But you're going to have all this time with. And so I think about some of you who do that, like those of you who maybe host a, a youth group or host a, a junior high or a senior high life group and are investing in the next generation. I think when you get to heaven, you're going to have amazing conversations with people who see you in heaven and say, hey, thank you so much for hosting me in your home, for sharing God's word with me, because I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for that. I think when we were in Uganda, back in August. We met some amazing pastor who, who lived virtually on nothing. And, and one of those was Pastor Donato. And Pastor Donato, there's a picture of him here, raised his family and then adopted about 12 plus orphans, brought them into his home. Another pastor, Pastor JJ, did the same thing was investing his people, could have used worldly treasure to make his life a little more comfortable. Instead, hey, I'm going to make friends. I'm going to invest in people. I wouldn't be surprised the reason you're here in church today is because someone invested in you. Right? How many, of you, how many are here because someone invited you to church, invited you to Christianity, shared to Jesus? Come on, just a few of you? How many? We're all here because someone invested in us. Jesus said, you can invest here, and that's the result. Or you can invest in eternity. So let me just conclude. How do you know you're making wise investments? Five questions to ask when you're investing. The first question is, is this going to control me? If I'm making a right investment, will Christ be my master or will this investment own me? Is Christ going to own me? Or is this investment going to rule my life? 
Am I making this investment? Secondly, because I want to grow my identity. My identity is in the things I do or is my identity in Christ? Thirdly, is this investment going to grow my heart for God's kingdom or is it helping me build a bigger kingdom? Fourthly, will this investment lead me lead people closer to Christ or further from Christ? And finally, will this investment help me trust me more and relax or will it make me trust God more? Where's our investment? We'll post those on social media. You can catch them later. Let's pray together. And I hope you see that that this is good news. It's good news because trying to carry the weight of all this treasure and hold on to it, it's a lot. Trying to manage our identity and have a good future and being owned by this, it's not easy. And Jesus came to free us from this. He is the only master we have who frees us. When we surrender to him, he gives us our life back. All these things take our life. Jesus gives us our life back. If you don't have a relationship with him, you can do say, hey, Jesus, I've been trying to build up my treasure chest. I've been filling it with things. I'm feeling the weight of it. And I know my life is short-sighted and I've become maybe a little extra greedy. I've been looking around, trying to capture all the treasure I can. But Jesus, I know you came, you died, you rose again to free me from this. Lord, would you be the greatest treasure in my life? Take charge of my life. Be Lord of my life. And Lord, would we wrestle with this question? Because we do a lot of storing up of our own treasure here. In fact, now we rent storage containers to store our stuff. How true Jesus was. But Lord, would we be people who would invest in eternity, invest in people, invest in things and relationships that will outlive time and won't end up in the garbage heap. And Father, we just pray that we would believe that you would free us, that you would rescue us, that you would help us live life now with an eye to the future.